Hi, everyone. So um, this is our first sort of conversation lecture. I'm actually going to sort of lecture of you a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about brief history of typefaces. So I'm thinking about where these things called letter forms, typefaces, come from, the historical context. I'm thinking about how the history has sort of like ended up where we are today. So um, I'm going to take you through this uh, presentation, which is a PDF from Alan Lupton, and it's also on Blackboard and also on the Slack channel, so you can see it, so you can review it, and you can print it and take notes or take notes. But this is also really important because between this assignment and next week's assignment, you'll get a good ground basis for understanding the historical context of typography and typefaces in particular, where they're coming from, um, how they're used, and again, keeping in mind that a lot of this is coming from a Western perspective, right? So thinking about that a lot of the history of typefaces and typography and design and art are coming from a very Eastern, Western European narrative. So um, recently, of course, there's been a lot of discussion about narratives that are missing, who's missing, what has happened. So let's talk a little bit about this, and I'm going to take you through this presentation. So one of the things you want to think about is, so the invention of printing is usually uh, marked as the beginning of sort of graphic design as we know it. The term graphic design actually wasn't created until the 1920s by W.D. Dwiggins, a graphic designer in Boston. But a lot of graphic design is created, is, is made to be created, or the genesis is around um, the creation of the letterpress by Gutenberg in the 1400s in Germany. But now we know or now it's being clarified a little bit more by a lot of the a lot of historians is that Pi Sheng in China was working with um, materials and tools to punch letters at around 1041, 1048. So keep that in mind. A lot of this is coming from a Western narrative. So I want you to start thinking, especially for today in our sort of very global age where we speak many languages, are looking at culture, are looking at how different cultures um, contributions to a field can add to it and expand. So think about that as you're looking through this and as you're thinking. So between this and next week's assignment on tracing letter forms, you should get a good basis for historical context of typography. So here we go. So you start thinking that movable type, again, you know, they start talking about Johannes Gutenberg in the 15th century in Germany. Um, and a lot of this before the moving press was all done by hand, usually by monks, right? So there was calligraphy. Uh, and usually was done for the bourgeois, rich, wealthy people. So a lot of regular poor working people were not being able to read. They couldn't read. So a lot of this was being created for a very a specific audience, a bourgeois audience that could read, what highly educated. Um, so there was this sense of black lettering in Germany. Um, here's what a wood block looks like. It's actually not necessarily wood, it could be metal, but this is what a letter in the letter press usually looks like. If you've had um, letter press, if you have the experience of working with letter press, you should. It's really fantastic for type because it also allows you to uh, think about spatially. A lot of typography is about the spaces between next to in relation and how all the letter forms, the words, the lines, all relate to each other within the space, right? So here's a traditional storage case of letterpress. Notice it's not in order of A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Again, keep in mind we're talking about a Latin alphabet here. We're not talking about a Cyrillic alphabet. We're not talking about an, an Asian driven, uh, an Asian character alphabet. We're talking about Western alphabets. Um, then it started to work Jensen in Venice, Roman typeface cut in 1470. So the history of typography the Western version of it, at least, is primarily focused on four countries, three or four countries, primarily Italy, France, England, and Germany. You can add the Dutch, the Netherlands, to that as well, um, so around five. Um, and those were the countries where all these advances and all these um, changes and and sort of innovations in terms of letter forms. Okay, so your work, so here's Jensen, created letters that combine Gothic calligraphy traditions with the new Italian taste for humanist handwriting, right? So 
letter forms mimicking calligraphy. Think about that. Letter forms that start to mimic. Then for the serifs, the endpoints of the letters, starting to mimic what a calligraphy pen does. So look at that. Okay. So here's a version of Adobe Jensen. This is the digitized version of Jensen that we just saw, right? Um, here's a version two side by side uh, of views of what the typography looks like. So the bottom is Jensen's 1470 letter press. The top is what we can do digitally today. Okay, so a lot of these classical typefaces have been digitized. Okay, so here's the Venetian publisher Aldus Manitius, distributed inexpensive mole format books in the late 15th and early 16th century. And his books use italic types, a cursor form that economized printing by allowing more words to fit on a page. Right, so a lot about printing is trying to maximize how many words, how many characters you can fit in the space of the page, if you think of, this, of a page as a space rather than a flat two-dimensional piece of paper. And again, the relationships between the headings and the subheads, the relationships between each line, how much space is in between each line, when do you use certain things. Take a look at that Q, look at that Q. It's just like calligraphy just expands out, okay? Also keep in mind, um, text in all italics is very difficult to read for us nowadays. So this might necessarily not be as, as easy to read as Aldous would have thought. Um, here's integrated uppercase and lowercase typefaces. So there's a mix. Notice how it starts to create interest. Notice how um, the hierarchy between this text and this text is created. Notice how the space is using. Notice the relationships between the sub, this little footnote at the bottom and this text and this text. So all of it is relational. So all the choices you're starting to make in a composition start to become relational to each other. What is being said by the closeness or, 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 or uh, not being close between elements on a page in a composition? Think about that. Okay. Here's Garamond, based on the Renaissance designs of Claude Garamond from the 16th century. And right, you start to see digital versions. Garamond in 1976, Garamond in 1986, Garamond in 2005. So one of the things you want to start thinking about, excuse me, the technology and the history of typography is that as the technology has advanced, the details of it and the precision of it has also advanced. Right. So letterpress is all manually and there's certain limitations that you have to work with. It's very time consuming. And now we have computers where we can do this very quickly. So one of the things that has happened because of that is traditionally letterpress printers were typographers. Now we're designers. So we have actually killed a, a job and we've actually taken on to it. Right. OK. Enlightenment and abstraction. So here is the painter and designer Jeffrey Toro. I believe that the proportions of the alphabet should reflect the ideal human form, right? So this is, again, the Renaissance and the, the, the obsession with perfection and human form and the relationship between the world and the human form, but the human is sort of the center of the world, right? Um, here is an inspiration, again, these are the ideal letter form, which was created by Iran scientific lines for Louis XVI in 1693. A lot of these are usually considered the uh, Romain du Roi. Um, it's the, the typeface of the king, right? And Louis XVI was obsessed with a lot of this proportion and perfection, right? Here is a type of 18th century English printer, William Caslon. Um, here's a type specimen, what it looked like at that time. And Caslon was designing typefaces, which this particular typeface is still very heavily used. It's actually the official typeface of the British monarchy. You see it a lot in documents from uh, the sort of uh, the birth of the United States. A lot of that, a lot of because of the relationship between England and the United States, the close relationship, a lot of these sort of typographic stylistic forms made their ways here, particularly in Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin, who was a printer as well, bringing typefaces from Europe. Uh, so Castline was for many years considered so like the perfect typeface. You see it a lot in books still. It's very beautiful. Here's Baskerville, another English printer, John Baskerville. This was usually considered the bastard version of Castline. And actually, Benjamin Franklin actually bought Baskerville as well brought it to the, to the United States and started printing with it, people couldn't tell the difference. But notice what you're getting at is this 
contrast between the thick and the thin stroke of the letter form, right? So a lot of letter forms, letter designing, you're constantly negotiating that relationship between the thick and the thin stroke of the letter form. And that's allowed the, the viewer to understand the letter form, what letter it is, et cetera, right? Um, here's another, a page printed by Baskerville, which follows sort of the uh, ideal proportion, the Fibonacci sequence, you might have heard, uh, two thirds of, uh, of the space is utilized. So you see these proportions around the margins that are, in, that are around two thirds and not even proportion. And even proportion is a more contemporary um, play on with, with margins. This is a more traditional way. And you find it in a lot of textbooks that subject matter hints at sort of a more classical traditional um, uh, subject matter. Here's a close up of it. Notice you start to see the hierarchy, starting to see the title, the use of the italics, the use of the small caps, how spacing is used, how a starter cap is used, how they use line numbers to help the reader um, sort of navigate the text, right? Here is working in the media of engraving and the flexible steel pen, 18th century writing masters such as George Beckham created lavishly curved scripts. So this is Beckham script, which has very, very beautiful, like sort of scripts, lots of uh, decorative swashes, um, decoration. Think, again, think of calligraphy. You're, you're sort of thinking of writing with a calligraphy pen. This heavily influenced typeface, typefaces by Baskerville, Dido, which is French, and Bodoni in Italy, right? So, Cathlon Baskerville in England, Dido was in France, Dido is these days used a lot in fashion magazines, and Bodoni was in Italy, right? So, the typefaces are named after their creator, remember that. So, here's Dido, Fermin Dido took Baskerville's initiatives to an extreme level by creating type with a wholly vertical axis and razor thin serifs. So Dido has razor thin serifs, which in terms of production can become problematic because how much, how thin can that stroke be? Think about that. Okay, and actually this version that you're seeing, look at the A, you see the super thin stroke and then the other stroke on the side is fat. So that contrast between thick and thin helps the, the to create the interest in the letter form. This, you can also see it in the end really clearly. This. To the, to, to, for us today has been taken to extreme by a lot of type designers. And that stro the thin stroke has been pushed to like a super, super thin detail, okay? Uh, here's Bodoni, uh, Italian, another very famous classical typeface. Uh, it's starting to work the contrast between the thick and the thin elements, but again, notice it's not as thin as Dido, okay? Uh, this is Roman and italic letters were printed by Bodoni in 1788. Notice the italics. And again, italics come from Italy. So that's why they're named italics. Italians started, Italian designers, Italian typographers started to work with curving letters to create the idea of motion movement. And that's something that's really important in terms of composition and narrative and pacing in a book, for example, or in a, you know, like even if you're working on a composition for a poster, how much movement you create in the composition, how you help the viewer navigate the composition. Monster fonts. Okay, so the rise of advertising in 19th century stimulated demand for large scale letters that could command attention in urban spaces. This is from 1878. This hit really big in the United States, right? Advertising. Um, these interesting quirky, big, chunky letter forms, right? So here's fat face. It's a lot of times people consider Bodoni on steroids. This became really, really popular. This is an ad. Notice the interesting, uh, the interesting use of the really sort of chunky letter form. And notice how the chunkier it is, the more difficult it starts to get to read as you get smaller, right? So some letter forms, some, some type, type faces are really good to use when they're very large. They're usually referenced as a display copy, display text, display letter forms, versus body copy, which is this tiny little content. You could never get this typeface to be legible in this size. So they had to change, right? Here is extra condensed. So a lot of this you start to see later on 
as uh, sort of the modernists take over typography and you start to see now different sort of what would a lot of people would consider, oh, you're stretching the letter form. When you're stretching a letter form, you're actually creating a letter form that is either condensed or rather lot extreme. So you're maintaining the proportion. A lot about letter form design, a lot of these glyphs, what they're referenced as, they're all about the relationship to the proportion, the, the proportion of the strokes. If the proportion is off, the letter looks off. And visually, we may read it differently, so keep that in mind, okay? Here's an edition of Slap Typhus around 1806. This started to be really popular in the United States. So instead of a very refined serif, you add sort of a block. Notice how square and jagged it is, okay? Um, type historian Rob Roy Kelly created this chart to illustrate how the square serif was manipulated to create ornamental variations. So you could start taking that serif and start to play with it to create ornamental variations to characters. And you can start to see this in a lot of sort of type um, type typeface design books. Um, the, the, there's a link that I gave you all for the history of typefaces. You can go through that PDF and you start to see how throughout the history of of Western typography, type designers have played with those serifs. Um, okay, so here's an 1878 advertising poster. Notice everything is sort of centered, the axis is centered, the composition is centered. Not always the most interesting way to create a composition. It's the natural way that we look at things, but not always the most interesting to create um, interest. So, but here the interest is created by all these shifts in typefaces. Some people, some designers, some will say this is just too much. This doesn't work because there's no coherent um, visual language in terms of the typography. Some people will love this, right? Here is a data poster. So we're starting to get towards the modernist, the data, data created, uh, organized in Switzerland. They started to think about it as poetry, think of words as poetry. So started to tried to get typography to start moving in a way that alluded to the intention of the language, right? Not just typography that is set just so that you can legibly read everything, but actually trying to get to the feel of it. What is the text talking about? What is What are the ideas? What are the gestures? What does it make you feel, right? So notice all the shift in contrast and the motion, the little finger, how the little hand, that curve, how it takes you up, and sort of continues to guide you around. So you're being guided through the composition, right? Reform and revolution, right? So this is Edward Johnston created this chart of essential characters of Roman inscription in 1906 um, in his quest to revive the search for an essential standard alphabet. Now this idea of standardization, it sort of plays on a little more about sort of the universality. This idea is sort of a very kind of tricky, dangerous idea because, again, we all don't read the same. We all don't understand things the same, right? So this idea of a standard could potentially be problematic. So keep that in mind, okay? Here is uh, William Morris in 1890 in England. He sought to capture the dark and solemn density of Jensen's pages, so a lot of content, right? Notice the spacing between the lines, which is called letting. You'll find out about that. Right. Notice the relationships. Notice the starter cap. Notice sort of the end, the paragraph marks, which are very traditional in terms of letter of a letterpress. Nowadays, we use a, an indentation or a return to create space so the reader understands. Um, you're at this point on letterpress. A lot of letterpress. Again, you are trying to maximize how much content you can put in one page, so they were using marks um, and and spacing to sort of jam a lot of content in it. Okay, uh, here's William Morris Colden to its Renaissance source, Jensen, right? So he created his own typeface. And William Morris, you may know him from the history from sort of what he was um, a British designer uh, who was very, 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 very a big proponent of sort of handmade work um, and typography and book design in particular, making books by hand, wallpaper, decorative, decoration. So the, a lot of that, he's thinking about it this way, okay? Compared to Jensen used today. So here's Morris, here's Jensen in 1470, Morris late 1800s, and this is us today, okay? 
this is we're sort of getting towards modernism so here's the logo that for the steel by Hussar 1970, in 1917, the Stiel is the Dutch movement, the new, right? So starting, you're starting to get geometry here, right? Here's Theo van Duisburg, founder of the Stiel movement in the Netherlands. This is his alphabet in 1919. You start to see sort of, he gets geometric, he gets, for us nowadays, it gets, you start to think of pixels, right? Um, more thinking about, if you think of, of, of of later on the Bauhaus, sort of thinking that the essential elements of, of, of uh, the essential forms that we have are square, circle, and a triangle, right? So here's Herbert Bayer's Design Universal for the Bauhaus, which is all lowercase, constructed with circles and straight lines in 1925, right? So this is all lowercase. So it's just literally circles and straight lines created this, right? So you can break it down. Here's Paul Renner, Futura in 1927, one of the most overused typefaces, very famous. Still in many ways, if you use it, it's very tricky to use. Um, a lot of the digital cuts of it are not as well done as the, the actual cuts that Renner actually made. So you have to work a lot with spacing, kerning the space between two letters. So you'll find out about that, okay? Here's Wim Kroll, Dutch designer, who created a new alphabet consisting of no diagonals or curves in 1967. And Wim Kroll was thinking very digitally. And he uh, was the head of the Stadlik Museum in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And he, was, he had access to computers, or to the beginnings of computers. So he started to think about uh, what computers were doing. Here's the use of it, the very famous sort of poster he created. Um, and now we get to sort of like the computer. So one of the things that happened, of course, a lot of this was being created by typographers. You would, uh, you know, like sketch and they would do it and send it back to you. All of a sudden in 1984, a little machine called the Macintosh showed up, right? And designers started to use it. At first it wasn't very uh, used in graphic design. People were terrified of it a little bit thinking, oh, this is the death of the profession. You have some designers like Susanna Lichko for Emigre in Berkeley, California, who started to use it and started to see its potential for a tool to make work. So she started designing typefaces, taking into account the limitations of the Macintosh, which was low resolution. The pix you can see the, pix the pixels here, right? Um, here's Philippe Apeloy, who's still designing and he still designs today and he does a lot of uh, alphabets. Uh, unique alphabets, unique letter forms that are just made for a specific project. Um, and he creates his contemporary variations on reduced geometric typefaces, right? So there's usually the geometric typefaces a lot of people use, for example, um, a piece of paper that has a grid on it and they start working with that. Um, but again, a lot of designers start to create letter forms for specific reasons, not necessarily the entire alphabet. A lot of designers go and become type designers or design entire alphabets or entire letter forms that they want to use for a specific uh, project or a letter form that is exploring a specific idea, right? For the proportion or the thick and thin of the stroke or there's a particular element of a letter form that you absolutely fall in love with and then you start to explore what an entire alphabet using that idea can look like. Okay, so we're starting to talk about type as narrative. This is modern, postmodernism, particularly in the 90s. This is a, um, I Am Not Tempo Gothic by Barry Deck, uh, inspired by letters drawn with a plastic stencil. So he's thinking of the process that is at once mechanical and manual. So this is also one of the very famous typefaces of the 90s postmodernism. Here's Pete Scott McKellar, uh, Dead History, which was a traditional serif and the pop classic Vag Rounded. So he mixed these two together, right? to create these interesting characters, right? To start to see um, what happens when you start to mix. So a lot of the typeface designers tend to, mixing is one of the methodologies they use, right? Or they, they take an element from one typeface and mix it with another and see what happens. Again, thinking about what is the idea behind the letter forms? What are you exploring, right? If you think, go back to the classical, to Caslon and Dido and Bodoni, you start to think they were exploring a lot, thinking of the technology of letterpress and how much they can push it by thick or thin strokes, by spacing, uh, so so forth and so on. So back to work. So here's uh, 
Susanna Lichko's Mrs. Eves, which is named after John Baskerville's housekeeper, who also happened to be his mistress. So this is Susanna Lichko sort of looking at Baskerville and being inspired by Baskerville to create a contemporary typeface that talks to the past, but it's actually about now, right? It's interesting, she called her Mrs. Eves, which was in honor of her his mistress. So start thinking about that, how type, the typefaces start to pull it, to talk to each other. A lot of serif typefaces are really heavily inspired by research designers have done of typefaces, revivals from the past. Again, that history of typefaces book that I gave you a PDF for, you can look there and start to scan and see. And then a lot of designers will find the letter form and start to ideate on it, thinking about what an alphabet could look like. What are the characteristics of each letter? of each letter form, right? Here's Mrs. Eves in normal weight and in italics, become very, very, very known and used in book design. Uh, here's Fred Smear's Quadrat, offers a crisp interpretation of typographic tradition, and it looks back to the 16th century from a contemporary point of view, as seen in decisively geometric serifs. So the serifs tend to be very geometric. Look at that A, it starts to get very sort of sharp. And this is sort of a, a uh, a signifying um, idea that a lot of Dutch designers use, this, this, these uh, geometric serifs. Here's quadrat, look at it in regular weight, I look at it in italics. Look at how the, the serifs feel like they're chunky, they're not as, um, uh, as a sort of refined line if you think of typography, right? They feel more like you took a ruler and you started to just start drawing letters with it. Okay, so here's Scala and Scala Sans, designed by Martin Major, typeface with coordinated serifs and sans serif variations, right? So typefaces are usually created in families, right? So a typeface with a lot of families is very, very flexible. A typeface with one, like one weight, for example, they're known as weights. One weight is not as flexible, right? So you have to get creative with how you can start to create hierarchy and contrast with one weight. But if you have a typeface that have many, many different families, many different weights, right, of many different weights to that family, then you can start to create things like this. Of course, what starts to happen is the size, the weight, whether it's italic, whether it's bold, whether it's regular, whether it's jeweled, and the type sizes start to create issues within the typography. So you have to start adjusting spacing, and you have to start adjusting um, the space between the characters and the space between the lines, and letting and kerning, all so forth and so on, technical issues, right? Here's Jonathan Heffler. Uh, this is a Knockout, a typeface originally developed for Sports Illustrated, a very popular typeface you see a lot on television right now. So it has all these weights. This is a big family. It's sort of inspired by the, the sort of the mother of all the sort of like big families, which is Universe, created in the 60s. and has Universe, I believe, has like 76 weights. So again, this is a typeface that you can have many weights, but has many uses. Notice from the condensed all the way to the very sort of like extreme fat chubby typeface, right? Here's another, um, here's several other typefaces by Jonathan Heffler. And again, typefaces are designed as systems. They're, think, think of them as systems that you can use and you can sort of pick and plug and play with the system to generate endless amount of work, right? Here's Giza by David Burlow. So notice how he starts to play with that idea, sort of like that really chunky, sort of like slab serif, but there's also condensed. There's, look at this, really, really thick, look at the spacing between, almost non-existent, right? And that's really tricky because the eye can potentially read that space as non-existent, right? And if, if you have a very bad printer, that space will disappear, that line is so thin, and then your eye just look, it looks at the form, okay? So keep thinking, these, these letters are form, right? They're like clay, and you can start to play with their, um, their thick, their thinness, their, um, their uh, sort of proportion to help us, to help get an idea, and all of that play gives you all this richness and all this, um, sort of life to the forms themselves. Look at the S, how they are. It's really beautiful. And then you start thinking about one of the things that, this is one of the typefaces developed for the using it with highway signs, starting to think what happens to type when you're looking at it on a piece of paper versus when you're driving. 
versus when you're thinking about looking at it on the screen or on the phone. What happens to typography when you start to move? And what adjustments do you need to make so that it is legible, right? Or not legible or understood or so, depending on the context of how it's being applied, okay? So this is a brief overview of the history of typography. Now this ends and now the contemporary take on it a lot of the times is a lot of designers are reviving the um, typefaces from sort of like history that they find. A lot of times they just find one or two characters and they start playing with it. And of course the technology. So Glyphs, which is the current software that's in vogue for sort of type design, has a lot of quirky uh, sort of tools, if you will, that allow you to do interesting things to the typeface. So the idea of typefaces looking a bit quirkier, a bit odd to for right now is really, really interesting. Of course, a lot of also what's really interesting in terms of typography right now is sort of the heavy emphasis of sans serif typefaces like Futura, right? So sans serifs created in Germany. A lot of a lot of people will say uh, what the modernists did was they chopped the serifs and now we have sans serifs, right? So you see a lot of sort of fashion brands have all decided that they're going to all go with all capital sans serifs, right? Like the Chanel logo. So, um, you know, typography is this ever-evolving sort of field. So think about that as you're starting to make work, right? Think about how the history sort of applies to the present and how they both talk and how the work that you're making is talking for now, but it's also sort of like has a foot in the history, right? So that's super important. Okay, so um, that is sort of the brief sort of overview of looking at uh, the history of typefaces and typography. Um, also, again, between this and the first exercise, which is letter sketching, you start to get a sense of sort of what the moves and what the gestures were that designers were making as, the, as time progressed towards now, okay?